thank you for coming today. We are very pleased to welcome you to the J. Irwin Miller Symposium, Is Drawing Dead? We thank the Dean for his thoughtful and invaluable direction, as well as the Miller family for their generous support of events like this. Our work on the symposium has also been enriched by critical feedback from many of our colleagues, and we owe them our appreciation. George Knight and I began work on this symposium about 18 months ago, and we are meeting to discuss the challenges we faced as practicing architects and drawing educators. We and many of our students no longer drew in the traditional sense. The sketch, the drawn act of conception, was vanishing, and with it, in many cases, the intelligence and visual literacy that is part and parcel of the making of drawings and of architecture. We found ourselves in ambiguous space. Over the last 15 years, there had been a marked shift in the means and methods of producing architecture. During that time, architectural drawing moved further into the digital realm. Despite the increasing prevalence of digital production, however, drawing was still defined by traditional methods and a traditional model of practice. Architects dealt with lines and space, and those lines were printed on paper as normative architectural conventions that we'd been used to as a common language. Line, detail, plan, section, and so on. Recently, however, drawing practice has begun to yield to myriad tools and modes of, of thinking and representation. Rhino, Revit, digital projects, and many other programs have allowed architectural drawing practice to evolve in radically different ways. The line is seated ground to surface and volume. Form exists as a three-dimensional construction of a reality in space. Yet, it is simultaneously the real, the built object in digital space, and something ineffable, inaccessible, a simulacrum of sorts. And during this latter period, these recent years, there's also been a remarkable dearth of writing and thinking and discussion on drawing practice. In the late 80s and 90s, drawing discourse was abundant and energetic. Writers such as Robin Evans were the standard bearers for rigorous consideration of the role and history of drawing. Drawings by Sterling, Morphosis, Marias, Eisenman, Hadid, and many others used drawing to think and articulate a polemic. And the architectural drawing, consequently, was a means of communicating a larger epistemology. And the drawings moved beyond representation to layered dynamic tools that expressed a powerfully held thesis. The drawing as a set of principles was in line with historical traditions derived from Vitruvius through the Renaissance and Palladio to Corbusier, Archigram, and many others. Now, we find drawing practice is ill-defined and under stress. Hand drawing is surely decaying, yet one can argue digital practice is also under duress. The line is gone, and with it, the rigor of the drawing is a means of investigation. Tom Main has described this condition as a lack of resistance. The line as a means of questioning and challenging assumptions has been dissolved, and consequently, the interrogative and critical role of drawing in architecture was withering, leading George and myself to ask if drawing was not dying, if not dead. So helping us to engage that question and many others like it, our speakers today and tomorrow, the first panel today, the voice of drawing, history, meaning, and resistance, seeks to explore foundational questions of drawing practice for our discussions. This evening, Sir Peter Cook will explore a wide range of visual and conceptual territory that drawing engages. Tomorrow, we take on digital practice more directly with our session, Burning Bridges, in the morning. And in the afternoon session, we will debate drawing's essential critical energies. And the conference will close with Mario Carpo and his talk on the opacity of architectural notations. The presentations and subsequent conversations promise to be divergent and stimulating. And of course, critical to the success of this symposium is our audience, you. We appreciate their many different viewpoints, and we're anxious to engage all of you in discussion. 
particularly since so many of you have traveled very far to get here and have a lot to offer the discussion. Following the conclusion of each speaker's presentation, at the, at the close, at the end of every speaker, we'll have a moderated discussion. And at that time, we'll bring in the moderated discussion with the, with the audience questions and participation. And we encourage you to talk and engage in the debate that, we're, that we've started. So on that note, I'm very pleased to welcome Cami Brothers to the podium. Professor Brothers has a BA from Harvard Radcliffe, a PhD from Harvard, and is currently an associate professor at the University of Virginia. Professor Brothers has been the recipient of numerous prizes and fellowships, and her book, Michelangelo Drawing and the Invention of Architecture, was awarded the Charles Rufus Morey Brook Award, as well as the Alice Davis Hitchcock Book Award. Professor Brothers also has a forthcoming interview with James Ackerman that will be published soon, and is working on a new book, Giuliano da Sangallo and the Ruins of Rome. Her research and publications focus on architectural drawing, artistic exchange around the Mediterranean, Renaissance theories of architecture and literature, and the interaction between the practices of painting, architecture, and sculpture. Cami Brothers. I'll just wait for the first slide. Okay, great. And the mic is, you can hear me okay, yes. Thank you so much. Tell them to turn it off. Is the mic up? Now you can hear me? Yes? Okay. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much to, for the introduction and to the organizers for the opportunity to, to speak here. It's very exciting for me to have an, an audience of architects for the historical research that I do. For centuries, function has dictated the conventions of architectural drawing. Despite the many ways in which the history of art and architecture are intertwined, this is a fundamental divide. Artists' drawings have changed tremendously over time, not only in subject matter, but also in every aspect of their approach to representation. While a striking number of qualities of architectural drawing have remained constant since at least 1500, if not before. Today I would like to explore what architectural drawing might do if its functional constraints were loosened. The question arises in part from my fascination with a set of experimental architectural drawings made in the last decades of the 15th century and the first decades of the 16th, before the conventions of plan, section, and elevation were established. But it also comes very much from the present moment. The presence and transformational power of digital rendering is an inescapable fact of architectural culture today. The preparation it requires can easily be seen as competing with training in traditional drawing methods, as if the two modes were in direct rivalry with one another and giving rise to the sense that drawing is at risk. But seen from another angle, the advent of the computer frees up drawing for other purposes no longer bound by the need for precision or direct involvement in the construction process, architectural drawing might loosen its boundaries, even reopening a dialogue with figurative modes of representation. I'll try to make my case today by first exploring what it was that early draftsmen were striving towards, goals still unmet, and then by considering in brief some of the promising ways modern and contemporary designers have used drawing for purposes beyond the construction document. What I hope will emerge from these efforts are the outlines of an alternative history of architectural drawing. Rather than focus, as many studies have, on the origins and developments of the conventions we know, now, we know today, plan, section, and elevation, I will consider experimental modes that existed outside these categories and accomplished different things. My argument will be that it is at the margins of 15th and 16th century practice, the modes of drawing that had no immediate imitators, that a possible future of ar for architectural drawing can be found. First, I should suggest what is alternative about this narrative that I am presenting. Studies of Renaissance drawing in the past have typically been concerned in a retrospective manner with how things got to be the way they are. In other words, how did draftsmen arrive through fits and starts at orthogonal drawing, and how and why did they reject perspectival drawing? The unstated premise is typically that these conventions were in some way inevitable and are in all ways superior. The underlying historical paradigm of this dominant narrative is that things get better over time. 
In specific terms, the assumption is that orthogonal drawing was a notable improvement over the haphazard and imprecise modes of drawings that came before. My own premise is different. I will argue that architects such as Giuliano da Sangallo and Baldessari Peruzzi demonstrated a range of possibilities for architectural drawing that have been little explored since. In a series of exploratory drawings, they mapped out a territory between the traditional confines of architectural drawing and the conventions of painting. Conceptually, their drawings are defined not by the will towards abstraction, but by their inclusiveness of visual facts and experiential conditions typically omitted. For example, the passage of time, the quality of light, and the experience of moving through a building. All of these belong to traditional concerns of painters, and it in fact seems that both of architects took inspiration from the works, work of painters who had come before them. And I should say, um, this is basically just an evocative back backdrop suggesting kind of how architects drew monuments. It's not, I'm not talking about it directly. Some of the achievements of 16th century Italian draftsmen have had an extremely long afterlife in the history of architecture. Architects such as Antonio da Sangallo the Younger and Palladio, whose uh, drawing is shown here, employed plan, section, and elevation in a way that established a pattern that would be followed for many centuries, um, of course, in part through publication, as in Palladio's four books. I will focus instead on aspects of architectural um, representation that, that uh, were ignored by later generations. Um, these, in particular, these concern that experience of a building through time is conceived in two main ways. First, there is the perception and understanding of an existing building as a thing that is passed through history, but that simultaneously lives in the present. And second, there is the sense of how a building's exterior and interior may be perceived and experienced in relation to one another. While the unusual modes of representation employed by Sangalo and Peruzzi are tr traditionally criticized as being, by historians as being fantastical or painterly, I will suggest that they succeed in conveying types of information that are typically neglected. I will allude only in passing to Giuliano's built architecture, but it is crucial to understand that his buildings Drawings of Rome were a form of research, and he often drew ancient buildings analogous to those he was on the verge of building. Um, so he, just to give you a sample of his work, here's uh, Santa Maria delle Carceri in Prato, um, Poggio Acaiano, the villa, um, Palazzo Strozzi in Florence, and Santa Maria uh, Maddalena dei Pazzi in Florence. While I will characterize Giuliano's approach in various ways, most broadly, I want to suggest that in place of the singularity of moment and view, privileged by perspective, his drawings demonstrate an interest in uh, temporal simultaneity and multiplicity of viewpoint. These, representation, these representational modes reflect a desire to render the experience of ancient architecture rather than only its, its abstract qualities. The terms through which Giuliano saw the past owed much to Petrarch, who in the 14th century had described the status of the poet caught between the reflection on ancient, the ancient glory of Rome and a drive to create new works. In particular, Giuliano took up the Petrarchan conceit of what I will call double time, corresponding to Petrarch's feeling that he was living in two historical moments simultaneously. Among his peers, Giuliano was virtually alone in his concern for the temporal quality of monuments. Many architects, such as here Cronica, took things from the ruins. They took measurements, they took forms, and most worryingly, they took physical materials, sometimes in the form of limestone, sometimes as prized spolia. Although architects would often note the original location or frag of a fragment or monument, they typically showed little or no, no concern for its existence as a physical artifact. Giuliano, by contrast, engaged empathetically with the ruined monuments, and these are two pages from his book, um, the, his book of drawings, the Codex Barberini, um, made between roughly um, 1465 and 1516, and held in the Vatican Library. 
he conveyed, even enhanced, their status as historical monuments that had experienced the passage of time and the onslaught of weather. One of the most elaborative occasions of double time occurs in Giuliano's drawing of the so-called Cryptobalbi, an arch structure reduced to a single, now reduced to a single arch in the ghetto and also known as the Porticus Minutia. This is another view and uh, this is one of the few details where you can see, um, sorry, um, of Giuliano's drawing where you can see a correspondence to the present monument. While recording its measurements, and remarking on its, the technique of, oh sorry, um, and remarking on its technique of marble revetment, he employs a dramatic gra graphic means to demonstrate the effects of time on the surface of the building and on the ruins arrayed under the arches. Thomas Green has written of the act of disinterment un undertaken metaphorically by Petrarch and later humanists, unearthing the literary remains of antiquity so as to resurrect them. In Giuliano's vision, as in reality for architects, the disinterment is literal. The seated figure, um, and I'm sorry, this is quite a, it's, it's a little hard to make out. Um, the seated figure here seems to be perched on the edge of an abyss, a crack in the marble terrain. His nudity and the toga worn by the standing man to whom he turns and gestures suggest that these are meant to be ancient figures. Temporally then, Giuliano's drawing works at a minimum of two levels. The condition of the monument emphasizes the passage of time since antiquity, while the presence of the nude and toga-wearing figures suggests that the historical moment is not quite over. Giuliano's inscription also suggests the doubleness of time. He writes that it is, it is said that this is, was the baths of Marco Agrippa, and here one sees how the Romans convey, covered their walls with a marble veneer, while indicating that the monument occupies Piazza Judea, where today there are many but butchers, forcefully evoking the present. The first clue about an interpretation of the drawing may reside in the choice of monuments included in the background. In the middle of the left arch is a variation on the mausoleum of Augustus. Um, here. Um, Augustus was best known among architects for the claim that he had found Rome a city of brick and left it a city of marble. Giuliano thematizes materiality by representing uh, the left and right arches differently with the left adorned and the right exposed. Giuliano represented the porticus as a facade and thus transformed it retrospectively into a model for his own designs of Palazzo Cocchi, um, seen especially in the window details. The possibility of this transformation is already suggested by the way the facade of the palace in the background echoes, echoes the composition of the porticus. The message directed towards a patron could, could go something like this. Augustus turned a city of brick into a city of marble, and using this economical technique, you can do the same. Exactly how is suggested by the annotation about revetment and less directly by the palace in the background. The shrubbery on its roof suggests that the building is supposed to be ancient, but it is a Roman, clearly a Roman Renaissance style palace, not unlike the Cancelleria. The doubleness of time Giuliano presents here had precedence within the visual as well as literary tradition. Tuscan paintings of the 14th century often employ architectural divisions as a means of conveying distinct sequential temporal moments in a single frame. For example, in St. Nicholas Brings a Child Back to Life by Ambrogio Lorenzetti at the Uffizi from 1332, we understand the arc of a child's murder and revival through the division of architectural spaces. Um, these pictorial devices were crucial for the illustration of miraculous events on the part of saints, whose intercessions could most dramatically be shown by representing both the moment of the tragedy and its aftermath, saved by the saint. More than has been acknowledged, this tradition continued through the 16th century in paintings by Filippo Lippi and Pontormo, for example. And so what I'm referring to is just the kind of complex uses of space in these paintings by Lippi and Pontormo in relation to um, narrative. 15th and 16th century painters so frequently place biblical figures in contemporary settings that we have almost ceased to see them for their strangeness. <coughs> A prominent example includes Ghirlandaio's representation of contemporary Florence and 
um, the chapel of uh, Santa Trinita and of a ruined arch uh, in the nativity scene shown here. Similarly familiar was the allegorical placement of ruined monuments in the background of nativity scenes, uh, as in this painting by Botticelli, to demonstrate the collapse of pa paganism and the triumph of Christianity. Giuliano drew from all these traditions and provided his viewer with a, thus providing his viewer with a key to the interpretation of his images even when the figures were made into minor players or removed. Another component of Giuliano's interest in time occurs in his attempts to render the sequential experience of seeing a building's exterior and its interior as if these occurred in a single moment. In this case, his temporal and spatial investigations overlap. In the Codex Barberini, he represents two temples side by side, one at Ostia and in the Forum Boarium in Rome. He includes multiple representations of um, round temples, but these are unusual for the amount of in information he includes. His inscriptions, his inscription which says, how the temple whose plan is drawn below appeared inside and outside, modestly states the impressive ambition of the drawing, one that no established convention of representation has yet achieved. This idea of simultaneous views also had a rich pictorial tradition, especially in 14th century Siena. In the context of a painting, in the context of a painting, it had several obvious virtues. It could convey more narrative information in a smaller amount of space by placing a building within an urban setting, but also allowing the main event, um, in, allowing the main event to take place inside. A spectacular example of the inclusion of information about interior and exterior simultaneously occurs in Ambrogio Lorenzetti's presentation of the temple of 1342. He provides a full sense of the materials and architecture of the temple's exterior, as well as its interior. Even Giuliano's conceit of using a ruined building to expose its interior had already been employed by this generation of painters. Pietro Lorenzetti had already used a similar solution in his frescoes at Assisi, illustrating the life of St. Francis, showing a church in just enough disrepair so as to expose the crucifix within. The insideness and outsideness of buildings was an important issue in Renaissance design. Giuliano's representations of his design for a church at San Giovanni uh, de Fiorentini, uh, which is here, and um, as compared with his drawing of the mausoleum of Theodoric in Ravenna, suggests the direct implications of his representation of ancient spaces for his design practice. Another realm in which this problem of inside and outside is crucial is anatomy. In, this, in the arena of dissection, in which the entire purpose is to understand the interior of the shell that is our visible body, simultaneous representation brings tremendous analytical advantages. Leonardo da Vinci's innovations in this, his representation of the human wo womb and skull, combining a cross-section, in the case of the skull, combining a cross-section, a perspective drawing, and a bird's eye view, have features in common with his architectural drawings, as well as those of Giuliano. Anatomical study had none of the constraints of architectural drawing, in that it was not being used to build or measure anything, only to understand. While Giuliano's most adventurous drawings concerned existing monuments, Baldessari Peruzzi's graphic imagination flourished in response to the challenges of representing his own designs. Among his most extraordinary drawings is his representation of his design for St. Peter's, which is simultaneously a splayed perspective. Um, it's one detail, another detail. Um, what I have called an inside-outside drawing and a perspectival view of the plan. It also contains a temporal idea in that it suggests a building in the midst of construction. And these are the piers kind of halfway going up. In this regard, it is more complex even than Giuliano's drawings. It shows, in, it shows the design both in the stage of conception, the plan of construction, the view of the piers being erected, and of execution, the section of the back wall. 
It resembles in some regards Pietro Lorenzetti's Nativity of the Virgin in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo, in which the space is splayed along two axes so as to convey many types of information simultaneously. Other architects, such as this anonymous draftsman of the, um, of the Morgan Codex, uh, attempted similar things, but none with such virtuosity. And it may have been the complexity of the drawing of Peruzzi's drawing that limited the extent to which it could become a model for later draftsmen. On another impressive sheet at Oxford, which proposes remodeling the Church of San Domenico in Siena, Peruzzi has taken a lesson from the Sienese painting, painters in the virtue of splayed perspective as a way of including more information. Uh, this is one comparison to um, Sienese painting, painters uh, and another um, for example, Peruzzi's, uh, sorry, Lorenzetti's fresco of the Last Supper in the lower basilica of San Francesco at Assisi shows the viewers the details from both the exterior and interior of the building, what people are eating, the roof and the floor details. Most remarkably, he includes the representation of an adjacent room where a scene both peripheral and essential to the main event is taking place the cleaning of plates by two servants with the aid of a small cat and dog. His use of splayed perspective allows him to represent not only the central scene, but also to suggest a new sociological insight. Even at the Last Supper, someone has to wash the plates. Peruzzi's Oxford drawing allows the viewer to see into each of the four bays almost as if standing immediately in front of it. He distorts the perspective both along the horizontal axis as well as the vertical axis, with the effect that what we are actually able to understand, the effect that we are actually able to understand the internal volumes of the design much more comprehensively. What is striking about Peruzzi's case is that he clearly knew the rules of perspective drawing and of orthogonal drawing extremely well. He was a master of shenography, a painter, and a designer of stage sets, all of which depended on his skills in these arenas. This is um, one example of his stage set design, which clearly shows that he knew how to do perspective properly if he wanted to. He was also the author of an uh, extremely precise and impressive section through the Pantheon in Ferrara. So when Peruzzi chooses to bend the rules, he does so not out of naivete, but from the point of view of someone with enough mastery of the conventions to be able to recognize their limitations and move beyond them. In addition to these relatively finished drawings, Peruzzi also used similar techniques in his design sketches. In these tiny drawings and with a few, with a few strokes and delicate use of, of wash, he deftly suggested the presence of light and the relationship between interior and exterior volumes. And I should say uh, this detail that I'm showing here is um, about an inch wide. The drawings I have been discussing were made at a time when the canonical modes of architectural drawing were in formation. Their experimentation took place not at the margins of the profession, but at its center. But by the end of the 16th century, many of the conventions we now know had become predominant, and fewer architects worked outside them. According to many accounts, this is where the story ends. Once the plan, section, and elevation had taken root in the newly professionalized practice of architecture, they remar remained remarkably stable over centuries during with which everything else about the profession of architecture changed. To some extent, this claim may be true, but I would like to suggest that the painterly exploratory mode exemplified by Giuliano and Peruzzi has continued alongside these conventions well into the 20th and 21st century. This alternative tradition, because its function is less clearly defined, has been for the most part either neglected or denigrated. In a manner parallel to the classification of Giuliano's drawings as fantastical, these have been dismissed as paper architecture. I would argue instead that these unconventional drawings, particularly when seen in relation to their Renaissance antecedents, perform a crucial role in exercising the architect's imagination and the viewer's perception. Briefly, I would like to outline some of the functions that drawing outside conventions has served for modern and contemporary architects. 
First, there is what Italians call the primo pensiero, or the first idea. This is probably the most familiar type, what we often think of as the cocktail napkin sketch. While few examples of this survive from the 16th century, reflecting its lowly status, they have in some cases risen to fetish items in contemporary practice, as exemplified by Frank Gehry's office. What does it say about architectural culture today and its contradictions that an office whose entire practice is made possible by advanced software identifies itself on its web website exclusively through a quick hand-drawn sketch? And this, I'm sorry for the kind of small and not high resolution quality of this, but it's directly from its, their website. Um, with this category, there is, a, there is, of course, much variation. And an interesting example is Peter Zumtor, whose primi pensieri themselves have what I would call a painterly quality akin to Michelangelo's. And similarly, both uh, architects were using materials not typical for architects, but more typical of painters, namely ch black chalk and colored chalk. Um, the second category is the dreamscape. In other words, fantastical architectural creations never meant to exist in reality, but ev ev evocative of the architect's imagination, exemplified by the work of Schauren, Hedjuk, Scolari, and many others, um, many of whom present in this audience. Um, at least in the case of Schauren, what looked outrageous and fantastical when he drew it in the 1920s and 30s, as in this example, has become almost commonplace and certainly achievable. The third category is the travel sketch, which, which is certainly at risk in the era of the pocket camera. It may be that modernism's discomfort with the past and the idea of emulating models has made the practice of drawing earlier buildings seem like a strange, nostalgic thing, despite the fact that Le Corbusier, Kahn, and many modernist heroes were devoted to it. And here I'm showing one of Kahn's quite extraordinary uh, drawings of Venice, or paintings of little watercolors of Venice. What is so clear in Giuliano and Peruzzi's drawings, as well as Kahn's, um, and here's another example, and I wish, wish could be recovered in contemporary architecture, is a, sense in which, is a sense of the way in which the process of looking and drawing something in the world is not, or prop, not properly, slavish, but completely engages the architect's imagination. Finally, there are design drawings. In this group, those that interest me most parallel Peruzzi's drawings in pushing architectural uh, representations, or in, sorry, in pushing representational conventions. The work of Zaha Hadid, shown here, and Preston Scott Cohn, uh, is important in that both seem to have begun with drawings, but at a later stage engaged digital rendering as a way of extending the discoveries they made on paper. In a different mode, but resembling other drawings by Peruzzi, are Kahn's design sketches and their indication of how a space would be felt. And I thought this was an interesting and kind of striking comparison. This is one of Kahn's studies um, for the synagogue and the Peruzzi sketch I showed earlier. There's another observation I would like to make about contemporary practice in the role of drawing. I referred in my title to discussions of Renaissance drawings and the idea of experience. What I mean by this has something to do with how the visitor inhabits, moves through, perceives, and remembers architecture. It corresponds to some degree with the concerns of phenomenology. In many regards, digital rendering has achieved amazing things on this front, mapping the precise effects of light on a surface at a given moment of the day and how it changes over time, producing dynamic ways of moving through a virtual building, and so forth. But there's a factor that runs deeper than this, which has to do with what neurologists are discovering about how our minds and bodies engage empathetically with what we see. When a ballet dancer watches a ballet being performed, his or her muscles actually engage in response to the movement seen. Although similar studies have not been done of artists, I would argue that when an artist or architect looks at a handmade drawing or painting, his or her physical memory of drawing is engaged in a way it is not in looking at a digital rendering, no matter how replete it may otherwise be with information. In my mind, at least, the future of architectural drawing has much to do with the extent to which it can move beyond the representational of conventions that have defined much of its past. One, no, only need, one need only think of the analogy to the state of painting today. Of course, painting has been declared dead many times over, but it un undeniably survives, changes, moves forward, and transforms. 
And whatever death knells may have been sounded, they have never been rung by the avatars of digital transformation. The computer will not kill the canvas, and the mere idea seems absurd. So why, when painting and architecture have for much of their histories been intertwined, is it, is it that in this regard there is a stark divide of the capacity of a digital or risk of a digital takeover of many of the traditional provinces of the architect and not of the painter. I would suggest that it is because no one, while no one disputes that the work of a painter is the work of imagination, architectural drawing has for much of its history been burdened with a long list of other requirements and expectations. As a result of the new conditions introduced through digital rendering, it is possible that drawing might be liberated from these constraints and able to more fully embrace the imaginative possibilities that have always been part of its function, but sometimes suppressed. I would also argue against a triumphalist view of history that involves this kills that. If we look at Antonio da Sangallo's copy of Fra Giacondo's 1511 edition of Vitruvius at the Met, we do not find any evidence that it slowed his desire to draw, but quite the contrary. He drew all over it, correcting and annotating and amending it in dialogue. And this is really in response to the, another historical idea of, um, of technology changing things, which is the advent of print. It is this kind of relationship that I see as most fruitful. Hybridity and dialogue between the traditional form of working of a traditional form of working and new technology. What I ultimately hope to suggest is that by distancing architectural drawing from its conventional roles within the profession, roles now better performed by software, it is possible to imagine its independent speculative future. I would like to briefly return to my primary subjects, Sangalo and Peruzzi, and to the link between perception and imagination in their drawings. What was the significance of, the drawing, of drawing the monuments of Rome or existing, drawings in gen, existing buildings in general for the practicing architect? Typically, this is envisioned in banal mechanical terms. The architect learns a set of precedents that could be reused at will. But in Giuliano and Peruzzi's drawing at least, the challenge of drawing complex Roman buildings forced them to develop graphic means of representing them. If it is true that you design what you can draw, then it follows that having learned to draw these spaces opened up the possibility of incorporating them volumetrically and spatially uh, into their designs. In this light, perception and representation can be understood not simply as modes of documentation or as ways of collecting precedents, but as active and creative modes of training the imagination and impressing certain memories upon it using the hand to train the memory to fuel the imagination. Thank you. Cami, thank you for a very thoughtful and provocative talk. So the only thing constraining us in our conversation today is time. And they're switching to the next one for us. So with that, we must rush headlong with our, into our next speaker. Um, Deanna Petherbridge is emeritus professor and also visiting professor at the, of drawing at the University of Arts London. She was also professor of drawing at the Royal College of Art from 1995 to 2001, where she launched the Center for Drawing Research, the first doctoral program in drawing in the UK. Professor Petherbridge is also an artist, writer, and curator, primarily concerned with drawing. In her 2010 book, The Primacy of Drawing, Histories and Theories of Practice, was published in June 2010 by Yale University Press in the US and UK, and examines the importance of drawing as a significant practice in Western art history from the 15th century to the present. It is a seminal and beautiful piece of work. Professor Petherbridge. Thank you for the introduction, and um, thank you also for inviting me here uh, as a non-architect. Um, I have to say that I haven't been into a 
review, and I haven't been into a design studio for at least 12 years, so I'm very much an outsider. Um, but I also want to congratulate you on um, the exhibition of drawings um, made by, um, which is upstairs um, around the um, Solari exhibition, and um, I was so impressed with it. They're so intense. It's such a good program here. Um, so I would really like to congratulate you. As I'm talking within the historical section of this conference, I have framed my not always entirely solemn views on aspects of architectural drawing and my critique of contemporary visualization images with a brief contextual preview of drawings from the 1980s the time that I was teaching drawing at the Architectural Association in London and writing for a range of architectural journals. The following images, I'm afraid, are probably pretty familiar stuff, but perhaps I approach them slightly differently um, from the viewpoint of a generalist drawing scholar. Peter Cook, Christine Hawley, and Archie Graham, with their plug-in cities, and visions of benignly mechanized techno environments had set the scene for a British love-in with drawing and futurology in the 1970s. But the reasons for the graphic explosion in the next decade were also profoundly economic. Many of today's celebrity architects from this generation spent years in a graphic wilderness drawing, thinking, teaching, and inventing, if not building. Although the 20th century had witnessed a total breakdown of media distinctions and artistic hierarchies, drawing as dream, abstraction, or manifesto remained the only possible, possible alternative for out-of-work architects at the time. Perhaps it was this enforced period of a sort of Kantian transcendental idealism um, that has made it so difficult to embrace so difficult for some of us to embrace the instrumentalist view of the present day, that drawing is an entirely pragmatic and mechanistic activity of no particular aesthetic value or consequence. The fine monochrome drawings of James Wines for best products built between 1972 and 84 were potent in a different way, I think. The drawings, is this me making a kind of bumpy noise? That's fine. That's just heavy breathing, is it? Thank you. <laughs> I apologize. Okay. The drawings were potent in a different way from the actual warehouse buildings, dependent on surrealist humor. The traditional skills, and I think these are most beautiful drawings, and they work with very traditional skills of finely manipulated pen and ink textures or loosely applied charcoal strokes, those in the image on the right deliberately mime the directional application of tarmac that was to swamp and roll over the drowned vehicles. All of these suggest more subtle readings, I would suggest, than the performative aspect of the actual buildings as verbal visual puns and built-in possibilities. Um, this seems to me an interesting and potent mismatch, and I'm not saying it's a critique, just as a comment, Normally, a building is the most complex and accretionary state of a developmental process that involves drawing. But the 1970s site warehouses were single state enactments or performances arising from a very rich drawings that continued themselves to participate in other narratives and histories. The parallelism and frontality of these drawings as in most of the drawn examples, which I will be showing in the next slides, are the embedded signifiers of architecturalism and the inescapable referentiality of architectural graphics. And I say this because, of course, so much um, fine art drawing is not necessarily referential in the same way. The slide rule and right angle are implicated within these drawing board images, in spite of their conceptual anarchy, as well as the dominating gaze of perspective to apply a phrase from Alberto Perez Gomez or other kinds of projective geometries. This might seem a very obvious comment, but the drawings of this era were offered on an open market, so to speak. 
and were competing with the art world offerings of conceptual art and postmodernism that had eschewed all such structural frameworks. The drawings of the late um, Raymond Abram melded colored pencil and watercolor in evocative and slightly melancholy images, evoking discourses of archetypes, archaeology, rituals. Firmly frontal, if laterally indeterminate, they usually depended on a, horizontal, on a horizon division as a form of philosophical plimsoll line, with buildings and carved spaces articulated above and below it. This is the ground, if I may possibly use such a loaded term, um, and I think of Dalibor Vesele every time I say ground, so that's why I'm saying, I'm saying it apologetically. This is the ground um, that traditionally separates applied perspective construction from the space of pure mathematics. As laid out in the watercolor drawing by Friedrich Gilly, who was a mentor of Schinkel, though he's very much the same age, a geometric metaspace traditionally occurs below and beneath historical perspective drawings, shaping and shadowing the uh, pictorial application. And this, of course, is in textbooks, not in the early um, 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 Renaissance um, examples we saw earlier. The 1980s penchant for excavation that challenges the certainties of a ground line was noticeable in many iconic drawings that also doubled as manifestos at this time. Gaetano Pesce, visiting New York, buried a church below a vacant lot between city towers, and Walter Pichler buried into a tentative and ambivalent ground plane in this very subtle but contradictory image. Emilia Ambas carved out a sunken chapel, reminiscent perhaps of the Ethiopian rock-cut churches of La Libella, in his iconic cooperative Mexican-American grape growers project, Santa Rosa, California, 1976. I think, therefore, and I'm suggesting by showing these buried, um, these cut-out drawings, that there's a haptic correlation between the textural responses of a feeling hand, um, which happens in these drawings, and the representations that appear to sink into the fibrous paper surface to carve out spaces. And this hapticity, of course, is something that has been replaced um, in, in um, um, computer drawings, as we'll be looking at later. I contrast this, particularly the, in these drawings, with the ubiquitous, shiny, and reflective surfaces that I'm going to be very critical of that we'll see later. Axonometrics and isometrics were most commonly the generators of strict form, and supposedly, as we all read, about objective spaces in the 1970s and 80s. And yet, when you look at this um, a selection of images, they could engender the most romantic, evocative, and inventive, in a way, pictorial renderings by very diverse architects carrying out very diverse programs. Again, I draw your attention to the predominance of the ground plane and its desire for embellishment, um, something, again, which I think has very radically changed. Um, axonometrics were also the generators of boldly abstract elevations and sections, free of shadows, but encompassing textures and elaborate facade superimpositions, and lovingly, if very laboriously, rendered in the very determinant medium of colored pencils. And these were favored at the time, I think, because they maintained the formal linearity of traditional drawing tools. They could be laid down, and they could be very pleasurably um, cross-hatched, could take hours and hours to really enjoy making a drawing, um, with a ruler, and their discrete coloration and textual inflections could simultaneously participate in other forms of color-coded structural systems, as you'll particularly see, of course, in the Sterling drawing, without a change of register. Um, that's quite complex, but what I'm saying is the, the colors are both about the colors that are going to come into the facade. They facade colors, they are predetermining colors, but they also color coding in very many other structural ways. Um, so these drawings that look quite simple are actually quite complex um, in terms of overlaying. Representation and diagram are also two very different things in drawing, are therefore united um, and unified two-dimensionally as a set of equivalences. 
that would directly influence the decorative geometries um, of the built form. In encompassing the potency and transparency of axonometric projection for generating a powerful new modernism, I do believe it was the force of Daniel Libeskind's drawings that blew apart the static concepts of 1980s architecture possibly forever. He wasn't alone in this, but um, I think his drawings were very important in this event. By moving away from what he termed the stabilized frameworks of drawings as, I quote, the fixed and silent accomplices of building and construction, into these compressed fragments which always defy orientation, and his drawings themselves are very often um, shown in different ways too because they are not about a particular orientation. Libeskind not only enabled his own subsequent buildings to challenge the pull of gravity, but he inspired an architectural revolution for many, including students. And I'd like to say that it, I think it could be said that the move away from traditional orthogonal, uh, orthogonal trabeitis that has so radically marked architecture of the last two decades, I believe was a graphic invention waiting for computer technology to invigorate its hubristic propositions. The Micromegas drawings um, and the more romantic drawings that followed, I don't have the date of the other drawing on the screen, um, have of course also since inspired many other non-architects such as the American Ethiopian artist Julie Moretu. By the mid-1990s, when I was installed at the Royal College of Art to run drawing studios, um, and I regret to say they were more inspired propositional cabarets um, than structured lessons, totally agnarchic but sometimes fun, where animation, architecture, industrial design, and so on, people um, attended from all across the school. Um, by this time, the CAD revolution had already exploded. Other forms of computer imaging, however, and I'm making the distinction, and in this I'm probably very ignorant, between the straightforward CAD that works out where you work out your drawing and between the kinds of imaging processes you're going to use at the end product. And these were still very much in a state of slightly painful technical evolution. This implied that potentially design historians would be able to construct a historiography of computer styles and be able to date the types of imagery that had fed back so transparently into the architecture of the day. Um, and I hope I'm not being unfair, but I do feel this Isazaki building looks exactly like what was then being invented, the absolute joy of being able to construct cubes and so on um, on computers, and I feel it, it fed back. There was a two-way um, um, passage, should we say. Um, I do feel it's conditioned in some way by the technological limitations of imaging systems of the day. A historical analysis, however, um, depends on the potential of digital expansion beyond the founding computational models that have shaped the conventional perspectival space and constructional principles of image making. In 1997, Alberto Perez Gomez had written that, I quote, computers have contributed next to nothing towards destructuring the hegemony of panoptic space and proposing a more meaningful and participatory urban space. Um, the, and I'm quoting him again, the tyranny of computer-aided design and its graphic systems can be awesome because its rigorous mathematical basis is unshakable. It rigidly establishes a homogeneous space and is inherently unable to combine different structures of reference. Um, and I'm quoting him from 1997 and showing you these images to say not all that much seems to have changed. The lower images on this slide derive from the 1990s, but are not substantially different um, from a design project in the year 2000, um, which is that curious little creature sitting um, 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 in the desert. And um, it's actually a tent, I've discovered, with a sort of built-in something or other that keeps you warm at night. Or even the, um, um, sorry, or even the imagery of, my next slide on the other side of that, is an interactive PlayStation game, which is just issued, it's just come on the market now. And it requires teams of soldiers and engineers to defend the Ark built as a self-sustaining city of the future, but now falling into disrepair. 
um, there's some message that the future can also um, disappear. The static frozen frontality and slippery curves of this range of cliched digital imagery to me acts as a mask or blanket on difference. It masks originality and affect emotion, not to mention building type, programmatic intention, spatial social environments, or philosophies of style, or the thousand and one determinants that shape architectural expression. Um, and um, it seemed to me um, really curious that um, that little scheme by Eva Jarikna had suddenly discovered Victoria Rock and London um, in a state London has never been and never will be. Let me make it clear, in spite of my mock melancholy use of an image by Michelangelo, which I started the lectures, I am not for one moment going along with the proposition that drawing is dead. I don't believe it for a moment. Far from it, I believe that architectural form, which is always driven and sustained by drawing of some kind, is particularly in vibrant and inventive at this time. And it's, it's a wonderful and interesting and inventive age we're living in, albeit often cited in inimical urban um, contexts. And I don't just mean that the wonderful buildings everybody's building are inside inimical urban contexts. I feel they very often create um, very public, um, problematic urban context. I think there's often a huge conflict between marvelous um, um, architecture and um, urban um, um, sites, but uh, we can't have time for that. I am, however, making a clear distinction between those forms of drawing and diagram which are associated with invention, critical analysis, communication, problem solving, um, development, and so on, whether hand or technological difference um, or technological driven, I make a difference between that and the use of a stale kind of heavily restricted cyber imagery that is only purports to res um, represent the built product um, and is not dealing at all with any of the kind of ideolo ideological facts which lie between a work and its representation. Um, there is no longer a useful nomenclature for these kinds of promotional images, although they used to be called renderings or presentation drawings. And it seems to me that this typological lack is a minor, but nevertheless a significant um, casualty of technophilia. In the past, the conceptual and physical acts of drawing and design development were produced seriously, uh, serially in a mutually determined time frame, and employed codified, we know this all, codified and designated modes of graphic production, marked by breaks and interruptions allowing for invention and dialogue. Um, such acts are now embodied within, embodied within a seamless, supposedly seamless and continuous mode of production, sometimes curiously at odds with the fragmented paradigms um, that they purport to explore. Of course, this notion of seamlessness is an illusion in a chain of technological shifts, from the employment of electronic sketch pads to CAD workstations to the expert accessing of a successive number of sophisticated programs, um, including the means for manipulating uh, moving imagery, which is often part of um, um, the skills needed for presenting biz, um, buildings. The task of designing and construction engineering now involves a whole chain of experts and specialists employing different um, hardware and software, all of whose activities and records need to be correlated. The plug-in connectivity of all these diverse systems is modeled on the unshakable, and I really do question this, valorization of the integrative worldwide web as the cosmic paradigm. We all subscribe to it, we don't question it. Um, this means that nothing whatsoever can escape the continuously masticating digestive tracts of the omnivorous cyber mouth um, a notion, of course, that had pre um, previously belonged to hell. With the inclusion of what were previously differentiated modes of thinking drawing into such a universalizing system, 
architects are left, and this was said by the previous speaker, architects are left with very few non-mechanical drawing options, apart from those rapid first thought sketches that museums, of course, are very eager to collect. And my example of such a drawing by Tom Main indicates how extremely informative um, such generative sketches are in allowing us to understand the thinking and development of a design concept. Nevertheless, the cult of the sketch as a collectible can also function in a very different way. Just as British artist Damien Hirst belatedly um, saw the commercial imperative of post-production sketches, to promote his Duchampian-inspired vitrines of sharks and what have you pickled in formaldehyde. So for some architectural practices, sketches now function as a species of logo identity, intended to humanize huge projects. Such sketches might not really be about autograph or origins of ideas, but they set out to proclaim the human eye and hand concealed within the computer, which has now, as predicted by Pichler, become a prosthetic extension of the body for most architects. By contrast, this slide shows freewheeling sketches of different dates by Frank Gehry, whose public persona, as was said by the previous speaker, is so closely identified with hand drawing. These drawings follow in the long tradition of the conceptual and generative first sketch as formerly indeterminate, even inchoate, speedy, careless, full of corrections or pentimenti, as the hand follows rapidly evolving ideas, immaterial, contingent, open-ended, because issues such as scale or materials or structural determinants or, or social programs have not yet been finalized. In these small sketches, we can just follow um, in this particular selection, how the building gradually clarifies and flee frees itself from the mass of swirling and gestural lines in which it is entrapped. The difference between the fragile sketch and the immense complexity of um, Gary's final project could not be greater. In this context, high technology sig signifies a magical and transformative means that appears to fill the unbridgeable void between concept and build realization. Of course, Gary's practice moves in real time far more gradually between low and high tech, through degrees of crushed paper, to constructed 3D models, etc., and drawings that allow translations into build form um, via super software, which I believe we'll be hearing about tomorrow. The enabling and transformative sophistication of the technology implied by the Gary office means that the firm can now even build buildings that appear to have all the contingency, seeming fragility, lack of closure, and determinacy of primi pensieri first thought sketches. The small autographic sketch for centuries understood as the very antithesis of fixed form, material, and scale, while suggestive of such possibilities, here has actually become identified with its instantiation. And possibly it could be argued identified but not reconciled. If I knew anything about philosophy, I think I would assume that all sorts of ontological and teleological propositions are set into a state of unease by these very extraordinary acts. Technology's endeavors to undermine physical laws outside as, as well as within the phantasmagoria of virtual reality have of course been a common visual trope of postmodernism. And I refer you to Will Alsop's um, 2005 building um, the Center for Cognition, Culture, and Computation. Um, everywhere over the world, they're all getting together, all of us, um, computation and culture, which functions as a space for visual arts students in association with digital workshops. And his scribble sculpture was, of course, developed in 3D from a CAD model. Of course, nothing as simple as a linear scribble can remain in cyberspace. It immediately slides into a potentiality of seamless and endless transformations in other media, times, and contexts. The 1990s obsession 
Um, everybody was a deconstructionist in architecture in those days. But the obsession with Jacques Derrida's endless chain of meaning deferral, I think here found, here find visual or at least cyber real counter, uh, counterparts. If high technology has now served to establish an almost inconceivable differentiation between sketch and built outcome, or a chimeric identification of hybrid states, both inside and outside cyberspace, it should not be forgotten that this was not so within traditional building paradigms. And this drawing by Eric Mendelssohn, one of very many for the Einstein Tower, signals a clear phenomenological relationship between the well-practiced curves of the drawing hand and the taut arched forms of the final built project in Potsdam. The determinedly autographic drawing with its variable brush lines arising from Mendelssohn's trademark curved horizon appears to prefigure in some way the active forms of three-dimensional plasticity with all the verve of a sculptor. And Wendelson, Mendelssohn, we know, didn't sustain this embodied isomorphism in his later works. And I included the previous drawing in order to contrast it with the promise of haptic interface effects offered by digital sketch pads. According to the blurb for Sketchbook Pro, I quote, because it makes use of the pressure sensitivity features of Wacom tablets, tablet PCs, and iPhones, it can help artists sketch and create effects similar to traditional materials. And I've deliberately shown the advertised visuals for this because the type of broad and fibrous sketch marks drawn on the screen are presumably meant to project evidence of the expressivity of natural hand pressures, natural hand pressures, made possible on gesture-based use interface. However, rather than suggesting to me that drawing is a free and open-ended activity that can be adapted for any kinds of purpose and future state, this quick fix advert projects a standardized, multi-purpose, grotesque imagery of manga cartoons um, that inhabits the entire visual graphic world from computer games to animation. And this is a, um, a hegemonic type of graphic imagery that is also an invading visual virus, simultaneously controlling and undermining powerful cyber systems. It's a wry thought that in such virtual games and animations, built form is usually only set up in order to be trashed, exploded, and destroyed while everybody runs around killing each other. Um, cyber aggression is as careless, I would say, with architecture as it is with the lives of avatars. And in support and also defeat of my own argument, I've included images from a very brilliant little animated film, Robots of Brixton, made by a student at Bartlett School, University of London, which recently got a prize um, at the Royal Institute of British Architects. And it deals with rioting robots attempting to rebuild destroyed urban spaces and dysfunctional social housing. Tadeo Ando's declamatory, even triumphalist drawing, which probably or could have been made after the event, celebrates the geometrical potency of the temple this beautiful temple, as inflected by the gestural imperfections of his swift hand. Except for the central bisecting vertical and horizontal, this emblematic inscription has little to do with the haunting textural and spatial subtleties of the built temple above and below ground. But it certainly informs us about the structural and formal potency of simple geometric juxtapositions. I suggest that when all drawing designing processes happen within the virtual confines of screen and infrastructural programs, caught up in the relentless onward drive of seamless computing, those ruptures that are very necessary for decision making um, uh, become enlightened and weakened. This drawing, however, reminds us of the power of the drawing as punctum or halted moment in a developmental um, continuum. Perhaps this is why Ando has returned to a curiously old-fashioned collage-style drawing methodology in this sketch for the Shanghai Poly Theater, and the drawings and models were recently shown at Gallery GA in Tokyo um, last year. 
the great sweeping circular holes that are torn into the prismatic theater complex to function as an amphitheater, terrace, and foyer recall the Anna architecture of Gordon Mutter Clark and his situationist work, Conical Intersect 1975 Below, where a circular viewing hole was cut through one of the about to be demolished buildings on the Rue de Beaubourg in Paris. The juxtaposed work above on the screen is, is a piece by the English artist Richard Wilson um, for the Liverpool Biennale in 2008. And uh, I couldn't unfortunately find his drawing, but it's very, very similar to the Tadeo Ando drawing. Um, and he also used crude lines over photographs, very old fashioned means of drawing um, for this building. Um, stylistically very closely. And I wondered about it and I thought about it and I decided perhaps this deliberate crassness of means employed by somebody with all the subtlety of Ando is means that drawing now it's been important to become an indexical sign of those brutal scars of interventions into the holistic fabric of existing buildings. And we're near the end now, and I'm not bad on time. This slide posits the difference between an extraordinary expressive and gestural drawing of Hans Hollein from 1962, where one can virtually feel the action of the outstretched arms of a crucified figure marking the horizontal plank of a cruciform shape, and a recent project where again such cantilevered forms are being employed. The tentative nature of the little project sketch um, 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 on, um, on your left, sorry, relates maybe, I wondered why, why is his drawing so changed? Why is it so tentative now? And I thought maybe it's a nervous expectation of the blanketing effect of computer visualizations in a technophilia age that I referred to before and that I've illustrated on the right. After all, this is an image that's put out by Hollein's office. Drowning by computer. Present day visualizations are so hybrid that it's often difficult to know whether digital photography with its ability to be endlessly touched up and smoothed over is simulating constructed computer simulations or vice versa. And perhaps it is this hybridity that defies the evolution of a useful critical discourse, which is what I'm promoting in this presentation. I end with two arbitrary selective visualizations for competition projects. And I chose competition projects because then at least you know um, that this is clever computing images um, and not doctored digital photographs. There are gathering clouds in the neoclassical Schinkelesque perspective vision on the left but not a single cloud disturbs the frozen perfections of the Cartesian spaces of contemporary England or Abu Dhabi, clear cut against their cloudless skies and safe in the unitary climate of cyberspace and the timeless embrace of perspectivalism. The obligatory water reflections could be interpreted maybe as etiolated references to a more modern semiotics of reflexivity, but probably not. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Good afternoon. I feel a bit moved speaking in this space uh, after uh, 19 years when I was teaching one semester at the Yale University. Um, I have entitled my talk, Drawing with the Mind, Pen, Hand, Eye, and Brain. Hands are generic organs characteristic to Homo sapiens, but at the same time, they are unique individuals. The vivid movement of the contours of uh, uh, Henri Matisse colorful paper cuts obtain a special meaning after having seen a photograph of the aging artist warming his aching finger joints in the feathers of domesticated pigeons, or drawing on his sick bed on a sheet of paper on the wall with a charcoal attached to the end of a long bamboo stick. Andrei Wozenski, Le Corbusier's uh, longtime assistant, describes his master's hands poetically and suggestively. Then I would let my eyes go from the face down to his hands. I would then discover Le Corbusier. It was his hands that revealed him. It was as if his hands betrayed him. They spoke all his feelings, all the vibrations of the inner life that his face tried to conceal. Hands that uh, might have uh, thought, the uh, hands that one might have thought Le Corbusier had drawn himself with that trait made of a thousand small successive traces that seem to look for one another, but that in the end formed a precise and exact line. That unique contour that outlined the shape and refined it in space. Hands that seem to hesitate, but from which precision came. Hands that always thought, just like he did in his thinking. And on his hands, one could read his anxiety, his disappointments, his emotions, and his hopes. Hands that had drawn and were to draw all his work. Works of art and architecture extend the hands, the hand, both through space and time. When looking at Rondadini Pietà, I can feel the passionate and wise, but already feeble hands of Michelangelo. He's known to have worked on this very piece a few days before his death. The work of great architects also invite the imagined presence of the architect's figure and hand as the architectural space, scale and detailing are unavoidable, unavoidably products and projections of the maker's body and hand. We can touch the hands of Michelangelo and Palladio, as well as Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier, and Alvaro Alto, through their buildings. The hand of the master is always the more present, the greater the work. 
we use the notion of the hand carelessly without much thought, as if its essence were self-evident. Frank R. Wilson, neurologist and writer, explains the multiplicity and mystery of the hand as follows. Bodily movement and brain activity are functionally interdependent and the synergy is so powerfully formulated that no single science or discipline can independently explain human skills or behavior. The hand is so widely represented in the brain, the hand's neurological and biomechanical elements are so prone to spontaneous interaction and reorganization, and the motivations and efforts that give rise to individual use of the hand are so deeply and widely rooted that we must admit we are trying to explain a basic imperative of human life. We can certainly conclude that the hand speaks to the brain as surely as the brain speaks to the hand. Wilson regards the hand even beyond its physical and neurological significance, sig significances as an essential constituent of the story of human intelligence and its gradual evolution. <coughs> any, uh, he writes, any theory of human intelligence which ignores the independence of hand and brain function, the historic origins of that relationship, the impact of that history on develop developmental dynamics in modern humans is grossly misleading and sterile. Yes, we usually think that our hands merely deal with the concrete material world, but some theorists attribute to the hand a significant role even in the emergence of symbolic thought. There are quite impressive theories about uh, language originating in the hand. In addition to the tool, a skilled practice of drawing or craft combines imagination with the hand. Every exercise of drawing or craft projects determined intentionality and an imagined vision of the completed task or object at hand. Richard Sennett makes two basic arguments about the in interaction of the bodily actions of the hand and imagination. Quote, First, that all skills, even the most abstract, begin as bodily practices. Second, that technical understanding develops through the powers of imagination. The first argument focuses on knowledge gained in the hand through touch and movement. Uh, the argument about imagination begins by explore, exploring language that attempts to direct and guide bodily skills. The draftsman and drawer need to develop specific relationships between thought and making, idea and execution, action and matter, learning and performance, self-identity and work, pride and humility. The draftsman craftsman needs to embody the tool 
or instrument internalize the nature of the materials being used and eventually turn him herself into the drawing or product, either material or immaterial. In his book, Berger on Drawing, John Berger, points out this identification of fusion of the maker and his, her product in the craft of drawing. Each confirmation or de denial brings you closer to the object until finally you are, as it were, inside it. The contours you have drawn no longer marking the edge of what you have seen, but the edge of what you have become. While drawing, a mature designer and architect is not focused on the lines of the, of the drawing as he is envisioning the object itself and in his mind holding the object in his hand or occupying the space being designed. This is a sketch by Alvarado. During the design process, the architect occupies the very structure that the lines of the drawing secondarily represent. As a consequence of the mental transfer from the actuality of the drawing or the model to the material reality of the project, the images with which the designer advances are not mere visual renderings. They constitute a fully imaginative, haptic, and multisensory reality. The architect moves about in the imagined building, however, however large and complex it may be, as if walking in a building and touching all its surfaces and sensing the materiality, temperature and texture. This is an intimacy that is surely difficult, if not impossible, to simulate through computerized means of simulation and modeling. While working on a drawing, one concretely touches all the edges and surfaces of the designed object by the tip of the pencil that has become the extension of one's fingertips and the inner world of the mind, welt in and round, to use beautiful, the, the beautiful notion of Rainer Maria Rilke. The hand-eye-mind connection in drawing is natural and fluent, as if the pencil were a bridge that mediates between uh, several realities, and the focus can be constantly shifted between the physical drawing and the non-existent object in the mental space that the drawing depicts. Sketching and drawing are spatial and haptic exercises that fuse the external reality of space and matter and the internal reality of perception, thought, and mental imagery into a singular and dialectic entity. As I sketch a contour of an object, human figure, or landscape, I actually touch and feel the surface of the subject of my attention, and unconsciously I sense and internalize its character. In addition to the mere correspondence of the observed and depicted outline, I also mimic the line rhythm with my muscles and eventually the image becomes recorded in the muscular memory, uh, sorry, in the muscular mem memory. In fact, every act of sketching and drawing produces three different sets of images. The drawing that appears on the paper, the visual image recorded in my cerebral memory, and a muscular memory of the act of drawing itself. All three images are not mere momentary snapshots 
as they are recordings of a temporal process of successive perception, measuring, evaluation, correction, and re-evaluation. A drawing is an image that compresses an entire process and it uses a distinct duration into an image. A sketch is in fact a temporal image, a piece of cinematic action recorded in the graphic form. This multiple nature of the sketch, its layered exposure, as it were, makes me remember each one of the hundreds of sketches that I have made around the world during my 50 years of traveling, whereas I can hardly recall any of the photographs, that thousands of photographs that I have taken because of the weaker embodied recording in taking a photograph. In the last decades of the 19th century, at the time that photography emerged as the technique of recording and interpreting the physical and biological world, S. Ramon y Cajal, the father of modern neuro, neurobiology, insisted that all his students take lessons in watercolor painting and he reasoned, quote, if our study is concerned with an object related to anatomy or natural history, etc., observations will be accompanied by sketching. For aside from other advantages, the act of depicting something disciplines and strengthens the attention, obliging us to co uh, cover the whole of the phenomenon studied and preventing, therefore, details from escaping our attention, which are frequently unnoticed in ordinary observation. Without the art of drawing, natural history and anatomy would have been impossible. It is not without reason that all great observers are skillful in sketching. This was the father of modern neurobiology. Drawing is a process of observation and expression, <coughs> receiving and giving. It is always a result of yet another kind of double perspective. A drawing looks simultaneously outwards and inwards to the observed or imagined world and into the draftsman's own persona and mental world. Each sketch and drawing contains a part of the maker and his her mental world or in uh, and at the same time that it represents an object or vista in the real world. Every drawing is also an excavation into the drawer's past and memory. Jean Berger describes this seminal merging of the object and the <clears throat> excuse me, and the drawer, him herself. Quote, it is the actual act of drawing that forces the artist to look at the object in front of him, to dissect it in his mind, uh, mind's eye and put it together again. Or if he is drawing from memory, that forces him to dredge him, his own mind to discover the content of his own store of past observations. This is my professor sketching at the blackboard while teaching my class. When sketching an imagined space or an object being designed, the hand is in a direct and delicate collaboration and interplay with mental imagery. 
the image arises simultaneously with an internal mental image and the sketch mediated by the hand. It is impossible to know which appeared first, the line on the paper or the thought or a consciousness of an intention. In a way, the image seems to draw itself through the human hand. John Berger points out this dialectic interaction of external and internal reality. As he writes, every line I draw reforms the figure on the paper and at the same time it redraws the image in my mind. And what is more, the drawn line redraws the model because it changes my capacity to perceive. End of quote. It is evident that, that the act of drawing mingles perception, memory, and one's sense of self and life. A drawing always represents more than its actual subject matter. Every drawing is a testimony. A drawing of a tree shows not a tree, but a tree being looked at. Within the instant of the sight of a tree is established a life experience. Drawing, sorry, drawing and body imagery. The initial mental image may emerge as a visual entity, but it can also, it can as well be a tactile, muscular, or bodily impression, or a shapeless feeling that the hand concretizes in a set of lines projecting a shape or structure. One can know, what one cannot know whether the image first arose in one's mind and was then recorded by hand or whether the image was produced by the hand independently or whether it emerged as a result of seamless collaboration of the hand and the drawer's mental space. It is often the act of drawing itself, the deep engagement in the act of unconscious thinking through making that gives rise to an image or an idea. The second meaning of, of uh, the word to draw, to pull, points to this essential meaning of the drawing as a means of pulling out, revealing and concretizing internal mental images and feelings as much as recording an external world. The hand feels the invisible and formless stimulus, pulls it into the world of space and matter, and gives it a shape. Everything his eye sees, he fingers, John Berger comments on the tactility of Vincent van Gogh's drawings. This very act of fingering the objects of observation or dreaming, intimate or remote, gives rise to the creative process. Similarly, in the process, in the act of writing, it is frequently, perhaps even most often, the process of writing itself that gives birth to unexpected ideas and an especially fluent and inspired mental flow. It is beyond doubt that the hand has a central role also in writing, but not only the hand, as even writing, poetry or music, is an embodied and existential act. This you probably recognize, it's a photograph of Albert Einstein's uh, blackboard in his study at Princeton. Charles Tomlinson, the poet, points out the bodily basis in the practice of painting and poetry. He writes, painting wakes up the hand, 
draws in your sense of muscular coordination, your sense of the body, if, if you like. Poetry also, as it pivots on its stresses, as it, as it rides forward over the line endings, or comes to uh, rest at pauses in the line, poetry also brings the whole man into play and his bodily sense of himself. John Berger gives a poetic description of the embodied acts, internalizations, and projections that he envisions taking place in Van Hoek's drawing process. The gestures come from his hand, his wrist, his arm, shoulder, perhaps even the muscles in his neck. Yet the strokes he makes on paper are following currents of energy which are not physically his and which only become visible when he draws them. Currents of energy? The energy of a tree's growth, of a plant's search for light, of a branch's need for accommodation with the neighboring branches, of the roots of thistles and scrubs, of the weight of rocks lodged on a slope, of the sunlight, of the attraction of the shade for whatever is alive and suffers from the heat of the mistral from the uh, north, which has fashioned the rock strata. I very much like this powerfully muscular and embodied description of drawing. In Berger's description, the muscles and the artist's entire body seem to participate in the physical act of drawing, yet the act draws its energy from the subject itself. It is evident that the common understanding of drawing or painting as purely visual endeavors is completely erroneous. Due to the innate and concrete spatiality of architecture and its irrefutable uh, embodied and existential essence, a visual understanding of this art form, art form is even more grossly misleading. When an artist draws a scene, the hand does not attempt to duplicate or mimic what the eye sees or the mind conceives. Intention, perception, and the work of the hand do not exist as separate entities. The sole act of drawing and its very physicality and materiality is both the means and the end. Drawing is a singular and integ integrated act in which the hand sees, the eye draws, and the mind touches. The hands want to see, the eyes want to caress, as Goethe remarked. Or, nothing escapes the great thinker. thinker. He knows all, he sees all, his eyes are in his ears, his ears in his eyes. This is Constantin Brancusi describing his own piece of sculpture entitled Socrates. The artist's hand does not only reproduce the visual appearance of the object, person or event, observed, remembered or imagined. The hand perfects the impossible task of creating the object's very essence, its sense of life, in all its sensory and sensual manifestations. The individual brush strokes in a portrait of Rembrandt or an impress impressionist landscape do not only depict the form, color, and illumination of the object, the spots of color, texture, and light awaken the object back to life. Art must give suddenly, all at once, the shock of life, the sensation of breathing, as Brancusi states. In addition to breathing life into the scene, 
A profound work projects the pro uh, object's metaphysical essence. And in fact, it creates a world. Quote, if a painter presents us with a field or a vase of flowers, his paintings are windows which are open on the whole world, as Jean-Paul Sartre states. This world evoked by a profound piece of art and architecture is an experience, experientially real world. Merleau-Ponty points out the multidimensional and multisensory nature of the artistic world work. As he writes, we see the depth, the smoothness, the softness, the hardness of objects. Cezanne even claimed that we see their odor. If the painter is to express the world, the arrangement of his colors must carry with it, with it this indivisible whole, or else his picture, is only, his picture will only hint at things and will not give them in the imperious unity, the presence, the unsurpassable plenitude, which is for us the de definition of the real. That is why each brushstroke must satisfy an should be infinite number of conditions. Each stroke must contain the air, the light, the object, the composition, the character, the outline, and the style. Expressing what exists is an endless task. Yet, regardless of the endlessness or logical impossibility of the, of the drawer's task, the masterpieces of art and architecture succeed in recreating not only the existence of singular objects, but the very essence of our lived world. Thank you.